Hello, AP Psychology. Mr. Galusha here with 9.2 Attitude Formation and Attitude Change. Uh, let's get right into it. What is an attitude? An attitude is a feeling influenced by beliefs that we have. Um, so here they predispose us to respond to things, people, objects, and events. There is a relationship, a two-way relationship between our attitudes our attitudes affect our actions, and our actions also affect our attitudes. It's a give and take. So it's feelings that we have that are influenced by beliefs, and I can have those feelings about certain people, objects, events, and it predisposes me to act in a certain way. So what research has been done on the impact of attitudes on actions? Well, this one's really interesting. Um, one experiment used easily recalled information to persuade, persuade college students that repetitive tanning put them at risk for future skin cancer. One month later, 72% of the participants had lighter skin compared to 16% of those who did not hear the persuasive message. So this information changed attitudes and the attitudes then changed behavior. So this is information coming from the outside. That's why we're talking about it in social psychology. It's changing an attitude and that attitude is changing behavior. It's also important to note that um, we also stand up for what we believe in, but we're also more likely to strongly believe what we've already stood up for. So if I've already acted on an attitude, that actually solidifies the attitude even more. And that makes it really important uh, as you kind of look at people's uh, actions in the past that kind of gives you an idea of, if, of what their attitudes might be, but also how they're going to act in the future because now they're going to act to solidify that attitude. Okay, fine. I have an attitude. Cha. How do people try to change my attitudes or my beliefs about an object, person, or a thing? Well, two of the major ways, and I would watch this little video here, two of the major ways that they go about trying to change your attitude under the elaboration likelihood model. And don't worry about the definition of this too much in this class, but you do have to know these two. There's gonna be two ways, the central route to persuasion and the peripheral route to persuasion. So the central route to persuasion says this, I'm gonna to try to change your attitude about something by giving you very carefully constructed um, arguments about facts and data uh, and features. So if I'm going to try to tell you to stop using iPhones and to use um, an Android, I'm going to show, show you how better the camera is, how much more memory it is, how much faster it is, how many more features it has. But those are all facts and data. That's my central route to persuade you. But if you think about most of the ads that you see on TV, what you're going to notice is they use the other, the second approach to going ahead and trying to change things. And that's the peripheral route to persuasion. Here, they're not going to talk to you about facts and figures and data about the actual decision. They're going to try to trigger emotion-based snap judgments. They're going to use someone beautiful or famous to get your attention and make you want to be like that person. Peripheral route to persuasion really is how we see most of our commercials, where they're trying to make us laugh or cry or uh, be influenced by a famous person. So you should totally watch these two uh, different videos on the slides. Uh, here is one for Rocket Mortgage that is going to be very much about facts and figures and data. And this other one over here for, for Gronk is basically just using his muscles to try to sell Tide Pods. They have nothing to do with that. Gronk has never come to my house to do my laundry. Um, or, or do I think he's really all that great at doing laundry? Uh, but they're trying to use a beautiful, famous person to get you to hear that message. Another example, if you've ever seen the Kia uh, six-foot dancing hamster commercial, they don't come with a car, guys. Like, this has nothing to do with this. It's a peripheral route to persuasion, whereas talking about the safety ratings of a car, now that is a central route to persuasion, facts, figures, data. So those are two ways to change attitudes. Another way to change attitudes, well, let's take a look. How would you central route to persuasion and peripheral route to persuasion be used by college recruiters? Well, a central route to persuasion, think about it. So that might give you teacher to student ratio, how, how um, 
many majors are offered, how many sports are offered, the size of the dorm rooms. Those would all be facts and figures about the central route to persuasion, the cost of the college, the amount of financial aid for the college. Whereas peripheral route to persuasion would be the feel of the college, taking you on the tour, having you see the uh, how everyone's having fun, talking, having people that have already gone there talk about how great it is. Um, those who having uh, an upperclassman that you would look up to share that message. Oh, wait, that sounds like every single college tour. And they use both. They use central and peripheral route to persuasion. Now, there are other methods that you can use to persuade someone's attitude. Uh, please do not use these for evil, okay, my friends? So here's the foot in the door phenomenon. People who have first agreed to a small request, they get their foot in the door, are then able to get a larger request later on. I think this is an interesting study. What they did is they had uh, people agree to something, um, a trivial task, uh, and then they went ahead and were able to get them to do something bigger. So the study here I'm, I'm thinking of is the Drive Carefully study. They only had a 17% rate of agreement to have people put a Drive Carefully sign in their front yard, but it soared to 76% when they first asked people to put a little three-inch Be a Safe Driver sign uh, in their in their windows, and then once they agreed to that small request, foot in the door, then the researchers were able to get them to do a bigger request, put a sign in their yard. Remember, I told you that once we've acted on an attitude, it makes us more likely to act in the future. There you go. There you go. Now, there's the opposite of this, which is the door in the face. So this is a negotiation technique that you may be able to try sometime. Here, you you ask for something big. Hey, mom and dad, can I go to New York for the weekend? Slam the door in the face. No way. The next request is something small and actually the thing that you wanted. Hey, mom and dad, can I have $20? Okay, fine. So here you purposely get denied the big request so that you can get the person to feel bad and then give you the small request. Okay. Those are different ways that we can persuade people to change that central route, peripheral route, door in the face and foot in the door. But what happens when my attitude, my personal attitude and my actions don't meet up? Remember I told you if my actions were in keeping with my attitude, it would kind of keep me going. It would force me to do even more. But what happens when they're completely opposite? I want you to get used to this hand motion here. One of the most important terms in all of psychology that we're going to study is this really cool term called cognitive dissonance. Here, we have a thought and an action that don't go together. And what it's going to do is it will always cause a change. It might cause a change in thinking. It might cause a change in attitude. It might cause a change in behavior. But it's going to cause a change. So I have a thought and I have an action. I've got an attitude and an action, something, these two things and they're going against each other. They're almost exact opposites and something has to change. So cognitive dissonance is one of the best ways to get people to change because you wanna show them their action and their attitudes don't match. So an example here, let's just go with a really basic one. Someone smokes, they enjoy it. They also know that it causes lung cancer. Well, that doesn't go together. I enjoy something that is eventually going to be my demise. So those two go, don't go together. This is cognitive dissonance. Dissonance is coming from the musical world of two notes not sounding good together. So here is an action and here is a, here is a belief, uh, an attitude that don't go together, these two things. So what has to happen is there has to be a shift. There has, something has to give. Okay, here a person either has to stop smoking. So here's the smoking. They stop smoking. I know smoking causes cancer. Now they go together. Now it fits. Or, you know what? Yeah, I might die, but I'm going to enjoy myself. And so they, they up the risk here, and now this goes together. They're going to make some kind of attitude change or behavior change. I mean, we don't know which, but cognitive dissonance, when the two thoughts don't go together, you're going to see a change. This one's going to be your probably your toughest to come up with examples on. I'll be curious to see what you do. Um, here, you definitely need to watch this clip of The Office. This is good for cognitive dissonance. Um, you're going to find out that Michael's the manager of The Office, and he's Jim's friend. Um, so he's going to tell himself that he got promoted to co-manager. He's going to have these two thoughts that don't go together. I'm the manager of The Office. I'm Jim's friend. Uh, and so he's going to make his change by his attitude and be like, oh, okay, I got promoted to co-manager. And he was already manager. Um, so definitely watch that. Okay. 
That is a quick look at attitudes and the different ways that attitudes can change based upon messages from other people. So how people can influence the individual. Take care, AP Psych.